Forbes is awful. Or, to be more specific, the articles that I see on Forbes are, more often than not, awful. Usually, I could give a shit when it comes to news sites, editorials, etc., but when it comes to certain Forbes articles, it just makes my head spin. It's not even like Kotaku with the clickbait articles or Dean Takahashi being a book burner. These articles are written in just such a way and with just enough effort to convince me of the writer's sincerity. As far as I'm concerned, this isn't bait, this isn't a gag. I am convinced they mean it. So why do I bring up Forbes? Well, in short, I've collected three articles in particular that caught my attention and drove me to tear out my own brainstem from frustration. In order to best demonstrate how wrong these articles are and why it's concerning, I shall demonstrate each article in two steps. Step one, present the article as is. I will simply summarize the relevant points of the article for brevity, without any snark or counterpoints until afterwards. Seeing their stance in its entirety is important for the sake of being honest and transparent. Links will be in the description, I highly recommend you read them all in full if you question anything I say, so that I do not have anybody telling me that I took them out of context. Step 2. Tear their articles apart! The points that were previously discussed will be struck down one by one until the article has no leg to stand on, hopefully demonstrating that the writers at Forbes are naive at best and lying ideologues at worst. Let's get started with a topic you'll be familiar with if you're subscribed to the channel. Don't fall for this anthem, psychological manipulation, loot conspiracy theory. The article goes as follows with these summarized points. In an effort to rationalize just how much Anthem has gotten wrong with its loot system, some of its fans have turned to questionable sources to try and explain what's happening here. There's currently a bit of dust up on R Anthem the Game, where after a player exposed what EA is doing by posting a throwback to a leaked PowerPoint presentation from a year ago covering psychological manipulation of gamers, threads has been removed and all subsequent threads contain the same information are being removed as well. Conspiracy! EA censorship! No, not exactly. Not at all, in fact. That document is almost certainly fake. While I can't definitively prove no ambitious idiot ever presented it to any company, reading the thing through, all 50 slides, this seems to have almost nothing to do with the problems Anthem is currently having, and is full of complete and utter ridiculous nonsense. It's not helped that this document uses a screenshot of Anthem in it, likely pulled from the E3 reveal, which may take as evidence that this was EA Project, currently employed by Anthem. It most certainly was not, and is not, and Reddit mods are right to leave up endless criticism of the game, but take this down, as it's not just unverifiable, it's likely an old, literal trolling project. This isn't the entire extent of things, however. Anthem players are also pointing to a 2016 patent that was filed by EA about dynamic difficulty scaling in games that reacts to player data in order to keep players playing. The patent is real, it does exist, and yet again, it seems unlikely that what's being described within it has much to do with the current state of Anthem, if it's being used at all. Patents are filed all the time and never ever used, which could easily be happening here. You could replace difficulty with good loot in this patent and some stuff might apply. As in, if a user is failing a lot, they might start getting better drops or something. But there's no way to confirm this, and RNG with obscenely low drop rates make this almost impossible to test. I have done some very crude testing to see if drop rates increase after, say, I spend shards on an item in the store, but I've seen no evidence of that in a few attempts. All of this is combining to create a web of conspiracy that probably shouldn't exist. A 4chan document, an EA patent, and confusing issues with Anthem. The idea is that EA and Bioware have employed some sort of hyper-advanced AI to measure our every move in-game and out-of-game, and make the game and its loot drops react accordingly. But it's all gone wrong and it's why loot sucks. I just... don't think it's that complicated. The Occam's Razor's simplest explanation here is that... Game development is hard. Anthem went through a tough multi-year dev process, and Bioware's never made a loot game before. Hence, problems. The thing is, these psychological tactics are already in place in these loot games, which often play like slot machines. The point is that Anthem is doing this poorly. 
A game like Destiny will reward you with a powerful drop every X amount of playtime to keep you playing. Anthem, even if it's doing crude things like rewarding loot after breaks, is failing to engage over the longer term with these absurdly long dry spells where nothing at all drops. There's almost certainly no conspiracy here, I've asked Bioware for comment, there's just a game struggling with its loot system, obscuring what is otherwise a fun experience, and hopefully it can be fixed in time. This won't actually take long to break down because of two factors. Firstly, Kotaku's expose on this game brought to light a lot of issues with the development of Anthem, and to be brief, none of it disproves the conspiracy, and in fact some elements give more support for it. Namely, the fact that they were not allowed to use the engine components from previous games, everything had to be made from scratch, and they specifically said that some elements cannot be easily replicated in the game. Namely, the idea that you can't necessarily test how loot drops if you have the AI deciding for you, and unless you do long rigorous playtests, you're not going to be able to figure out what that is. All these development issues happening here from the Kotaku article demonstrate that very well. Not to mention, and this is important for that last bit when they say they asked Bioware for comment, Bioware employees have specifically been asked not to talk to the press in the light of the expose. They just aren't allowed to. They don't talk to the community, they don't do anything. For the most part, they can't talk jack shit. And you wonder why. It makes perfect sense as to why, because Anything that they would show that would demonstrate this would go absolutely against them. That's why there's no update on this in regards to Bioware making a comment to this Forbes article. Because they're not allowed to. And that doesn't sound conspiratorial at all, does it? Secondly, I don't even need to break down each point that he makes here. I can take every single one down by pointing out that the fact that the real patent actually exists and is owned by EA completely validates everything that is said here. You acknowledging it in your article is not some, oh, well, I said it in the article, you're not proving anything. No, you didn't. You just said that it was because you know that we're going to bring it up. Merely acknowledging its existence without acknowledging that it is the final nail in the coffin for this argument is intellectually dishonest. It's been in there since before the latest iteration of Anthem was made. Because people bring up, oh, Anthem's been in development since 2012. There's no way that they could put in this thing from 2016 in there. And that's why I say horseshit, because according to the Kotaku expose, it's been in development for 18 months. And that everything from 2012 to 18 months from release was scrapped and not used. The story, the models, the environment, pretty much everything had to be made from the ground up. Keeping that in mind, that's after that 2016 period. And since nobody's allowed to talk about certain elements of it, you wonder why people are having such difficulty with these systems. Could it be that the system from the engine that they already used in two previous games, in this case being Dragon Age Inquisition and Mass Effect Andromeda, they somehow stopped knowing how to use the engine in that time and just completely shit the bed. Like, there's still loot in these other games. Just because Dragon Age isn't a looter shooter doesn't mean they wouldn't know how to program this properly. It just blows the mind. And the fact that you deny that this actually exists the way that it does, it just, it's sickening. Because if objective reality is able to be called a conspiracy, then anyone who's not on DMT at the moment is Alex Jones. Even if it had less ground to stand on, or even no ground to stand on, the way this writer approached this topic was just petty and condescending. It doesn't help your case at all to act that way. Then again, I'm one to talk. But I think a published writer for a major publication like Forbes can handle a little more flack than some random Redditor trying to figure out why one of the biggest games of the year was worse than My Face is Tired Simulator. Not to mention, as you said in your article, that the mods banned his Reddit post for a day or so before putting it back up with a new tag of it being a joke. Yeah, nothing will make a alleged conspiracy theorist more pliant and willing to secede to your point than people silencing them and then smearing them when they have to retract it. In brief, 
the hypothesis of an AI driving RNG, and the reward structure is something that's entirely plausible and has lots of evidence to strengthen it. You even mention it in regards to, say, slot machines. The writer of this article either rejects reality or is weirdly defensive towards the game and its creators, Bioware and EA. It makes sense. That's kind of a deal that a lot of these online publications have. They speak well of games no matter how bad they are because they want those advertising deals going forward. Oh, you'll run ads on our site because we said good things about you, right? Yeah, that's right. Kickbacks in the industry. All the time. Regardless of whether or not they object to reality or have this sort of implicit bias because of their good work relationship, both of these standards make them bad at their job. And this article, as a result, is trash. Next! Sekiro Shadows Dies Twice I am reading that right. Sekiro Shadows Dies Twice needs to respect its players and add an easy mode. It's time once again to revisit an old saw. It was true of Dark Souls 3, it was true of Bloodborne, it's true of all of the FrontSoft games, and will keep being true until the only acceptable conclusion. One of these games finally puts in an easy mode. That hasn't happened yet, and so here we are. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice needs an easy mode. Hello, old saw. I'll be honest, it's not that nice to see you again. These games have achieved a kind of cult status in certain corners of the gaming community, where people use them as a kind of litmus test for whether someone is a true gamer or a filthy casual. The fact that these games don't have any difficulty settings means that only a certain sort of player with time, inclination, reaction speed, and lack of physical issues will ever see the final boss fight anywhere but on Twitch. This is a problem. There are other difficult games I won't play, and whatever. But the difficulty is only one part of what defines these games for me, and honestly, it's not the most important part. From Software has some of the best world building in the business, and I would argue, the best character design. Early on in Sekiro, I had to sneak under a bridge, where I found this bizarre misshapen hermit man that lunged at me with a wicked knife from underneath a broad straw hat. It was gross, strange, sort of thing you can almost smell. The first glimpse I had had of the malformed underbell of this world I'd only taken my first steps into. That's where I remember from Bloodborne more than anything. Something about the lonely, horrible way these characters move is so endlessly fascinating that I could watch them all day. And every time I see one, I just need to see the rest. But most people, even most people that like to see a sort of thing, will never see any of that. Maybe they have limited gaming time and don't want to spend that time fighting Lady Butterfly 100 times in a row. Maybe they're just not good at timing their parries. Maybe they just get frustrated and don't feel like being frustrated just now. Maybe they have a physical ailment that makes the sort of precision a little too difficult to pull off. An easy mode would allow an order of magnitude more players to see what From has built. And yet these experiences remain walled off for those millions of people for reasons I just can't parse. There's a lot of talk about respecting the players when it comes to including an easy mode. An idea that all players can and should play this game in this particular punishing way. And yet, I think the lack of an easy mode showcases the exact opposite. It shows an almost stunning lack of respect for players with the idea that they cannot be trusted with their own gameplay experience. That even those who want a challenging game would somehow be lured by the siren song of lower difficulties and destroy their own experience because they're too impatient or immature to know what they actually want. The summoning system is a perfect example of this. I never used it once while playing Bloodborne because I knew what experience I wanted. I didn't get as into Dark Souls 3, and so I used it liberally. And this is what I'll never understand about From's fanboys and their continual aggressive insistence that the mere presence of an easy mode would somehow compromise a special experience. It's worth saying time and time again, an easy mode does not have to change the core experience in any way at all, period. Playing a version of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice that had easy mode would theoretically be completely identical to playing Sekiro Shadows Die Twice now. The continued existence and easy mode would somehow affect the normal mode seems to represent a player's lack of respect for themselves, an idea that they would not be able to play the game that they want without ruining it for themselves. And so I'd say to From fans, believe in yourself. Know that you can play the game you want to play even if others are playing the game they want to play. An easy mode does not have to be complicated. Ideally, I'd like to see the sort of deeper customization that Celeste has, but all you need to do is turn up the damage a player does and turn down the damage the enemies do. That's it. 
I do not at this point expect to ever see my wish granted, but it is my wish just the same. Update. Since publishing this, there's been some interesting conversation on Twitter and elsewhere. Below, I'm posting a Twitter thread from accessibility expert Ian Hamilton about accessibility, difficulty, and how developers can think about these issues, as well as this article by gaming developer Garrick Doc Buford about his experience playing from software titles as someone with a physical disability. Article continues below the tweet. Boy, where do I begin with this one? Let's start from the top with the only a certain sort of player with time, inclination, reaction speed, and lack of physical issues will ever see the final boss fight comment. Literally every single game requires time to play it. You insipid legum with a keyboard! Even the most widely played games require a time investment. Look at Pokemon games as a basic example. You don't just get the strongest team, you start weak and you gotta train them from there. Does Pokemon require an easy mode? By your logic, one difficulty isn't acceptable, so there must be an equal need for it here. In fact, Pokemon is much more popular and available to a wider demographic, since it's kid-friendly and highly marketable. So, its need for a easy mode is greater than in the comparatively niche game like Sekiro. Also, let's put an end to this disability conversation. Let's take a look at Limitless Quad, a quadriplegic who was able to beat the final boss of Sekiro with an Xbox controller. He didn't even need the adaptable version with all the utility options. He did it with a standard controller. No mods, no cheats. Your stance that people with limitations can't beat it is insulting to the people who make the effort to overcome a challenge. On a more direct note, you can look directly at another veteran of this very channel, Perry. He has, in recent months, beaten all three Dark Souls games and Bloodborne without the need of an easy difficulty. For those of you not in the know, Perry, the veteran on this channel, has one arm, hence Perry One Arm Legend. So, to the writer of this article, if a quadriplegic and a one-armed man can beat these games, and you can't, it simply means you aren't as good at these games in comparison. It means these games aren't locking out the disabled on the cold winter streets of no game land. It just locks you out because you won't put in the effort. You know, I'm that way with the uh, RTS's turn-based strategy and 4X games. None of these games are bad, none of them are excluding me or the disabled, I just can't reliably get my head wrapped around them and I just lose interest. With the exception for Stellaris, but don't worry about that. Could you imagine me saying Civilization is ableist because the game didn't turn into a third-person shooter and win the game for me? Well sure you can, it's easy, just take that statement, put it in a Forbes article and ta -da! So you know what? author on this article? Fuck you. Fuck you for hiding behind people with disabilities just because you want to feel validated by receiving a victory you didn't earn. Fuck you for thinking you are so enlightened and considerate while talking down to people who actually give a damn about this medium. I would like to say fuck you and the horse you rode in on. That horse doesn't deserve that kind of punishment. That instant horse was just sitting there, being all equine and such. And some asshole writes for Farbs comes along, buys it without the horse getting a say in the matter, and then he rides into town like he owns the place, and thinks his snake oil sales pitch will fool anyone. On a related note, some games are highly chastised because of the low amount of time it takes to complete. Some people have said Rage 2 is a bad game because it's only 6-7 to seven hours long. This is demonstrably false, and will be covered in another video, but note that reaction. Less time to beat equals the worse th the game is. It's typically tied to the concept of the amount of content you get out of a game, which means that the more time you need to invest in a game, the more you're getting your money's worth. Think of it this way. Would you rather spend $60 on your average Call of Duty game for an 8-hour campaign in single player, or would you rather spend 
$40 on Final Fantasy XII, which has at least 60, if not 100 plus, hours of content. If we measured this on an hour to dollar metric, clearly the longer the game is, the more it's worth to purchase it. I'm of the opinion that video game journalists favor games that are unchallenging and quick to complete because of the nature of their job. In brief, if you want your game site to get the traffic and clicks needed to keep the lights on, you gotta have your review for the game out the day of release, if not before. The idea of a review in progress did not exist until the internet age of reviews, and this is why. Why give a verdict on the full game when you can just say what you think early on and still get the clicks? In regards to short and easy games, these are perfect for a games journalist, because as long as they get an advanced copy, they can reliably get the review or article written and ready to publish without fear of crunch or an incomplete review of the title. Things that require a challenge, like Sekiro, or take a long time to complete, like Final Fantasy XII, are the worst nightmare of a reviewer, especially if they don't get an early enough copy. Can you see why they would become resentful of these kinds of games given that criteria? Many of them look down on the readers, as if we were laymen or just plain idiots, so they won't get any sympathies for me, but I feel like this absolutely gives some logic to their disdain for difficulty in the get good crowd. Of note, in regards to this, let's uh, point out the stuff he said in the update where he's trying to kind of backpedal and say, oh no no, this isn't just me about this, I wasn't hiding behind disabled people, here's some you know, disability experts who are talking about this. First off, fuck off. You were absolutely hiding behind them, and when I was looking at the people who were discussing this, Ian Hamilton, alright, he says, Easy mode is a really blunt instrument, there are other ways. To start off with, it's worth looking at what the designer's intent is, what they want players to experience. Many assume that From's goal is to make games require a high skill bar. That's not true. Unless you actually talk to the motherfucking director of the game. To quote, Miyazaki has said, I don't necessarily think I've been educating the wider audience about playing relatively high difficulty level games. The basic approach is to let players experience a sense of accomplishment through overcoming difficulties. And set it a relatively higher difficulty level is actually only one of the answers to meet that goal. So there could be an alternative in order to let players experience a sense of accomplishment. And once I find that out, there could be a chance that I could pursue another solution, instead of providing the higher difficulty level. So, making a hard game isn't the intent of the director. But it actually absolutely is, because that's how he provides a satisfying gameplay experience. I don't understand how you people can post these things in these articles that just absolutely contradict everything that you say. We'll get into this in the next segment, but I genuinely believe that writers at Forbes just don't expect people to actually read the articles. I think that they have a headline ready, and then they type up enough to make it look like it's a few paragraphs, and then, bam, done. That's it. Just make it look long enough so that you're not just posting a headline, and no one will pay attention. Moving on. Ailita Battle Angel Box Office. Why $400 million worldwide isn't big enough. This actually happened on Sunday, but it didn't become apparent until the final figures were released with 20th Century Fox reporting 83.8 million domestic and 306.2 million overseas, Aelita Battle Angel has passed 400 million on the global box office. The film is essentially finished in North America, China, and around the world, so the milestone is both noteworthy and bittersweet. The sci-fi action fantasy, directed by Robert Rodriguez, co-written by James Cameron and Leita Kaurogritis, and produced by Cameron and John Landau, opened just a little better than expected in North America, and earned just a little bit more overseas than anticipated as well. But it's not quite a hit, and at this point a sequel is less than likely. The Fox release is looking at 84 million domestic, which is better than the likes of Jupiter Ascending, Jack the Giant Slayer, Mortal Engines, etc. All of which fell short of 66 million domestically. But it sold about as many tickets in North America as John Carter, and it fell short of 
Terminator Genesis. While a somewhat front-loaded run in China was enough to push it past the 400 million mark, it earned less outside China than the aforementioned John Carter. With a current 400.15 million global cum, it is the fourth Hollywood flick to crack 400 million worldwide without earning at least 100 million in North America. It joins Terminator Genesis, Warcraft, and The Mummy. All three of those got a big boost from China, but none of them, including Warcraft, qualified as a hit or earned a sequel. With mixed reviews, a front-loaded run in China and North America, and a global take that is slightly impressive but still not huge enough, the odds are not in its favor. Occam's Razor suggests that Aelita Battle Angel was a somewhat well-received that was still a disappointment in relation to cost and showed little signs of expanding its audience on the second go-around. The theatrical divisions are finally learning is that having no IP is better than having bad IP. As much as I liked Battle Angel Aelita and I saw it twice in theaters, it may qualify as a bad IP. This is going to require a lot of context to be provided, but stick with me here. This is a Bob Ross painting in the works. It ain't gonna look like a sunset just yet, so hold your horses till I paint a mountain in front of it. Aelita is a movie that people thought was going to bomb, namely because it's coming out in a year packed with other huge releases. Initial trailers were having mixed reception on account of Aelita's eyes being off-putting to some people, and Hollywood adaptations of anime have a track record that's fine, I guess, at best, and oh god, kill it, kill it, kill it, at worst. However, things actually turned out well for it. It beat expectations at the box office, premiered at number one, has good box office revenue momentum, and a strong performance overseas, with the Chinese box office saving the film. In brief, a movie in general is considered successful if it makes double its estimated budget in box office. Considering this movie has a budget of $170 million on the low end, less generous estimates give it a $400 million goal to meet. And it did, with $404 million being the current total international for box office. Critics were not very pleased with the movie for various reasons, but fans were very pleased. And this divide is becoming more and more common, with film and game critics usually becoming opponents of their readership on account of their differing views. This became especially prevalent in the wake of the movie Captain Marvel, in which the viewer reception was exceedingly low for a Marvel film, until Rotten Tomatoes fixed that. But critical acclaim was generally high, although not as high as other Marvel films either. A fairly common claim from defenders of Captain Marvel in regards to the negative reception was the accusation that detractors were merely misogynistic, and that they just don't enjoy movies with female leads, therefore their opinions should be disregarded. You may ask, Sir Leonard. What does that have to do with Alita? You know, okay, I want to tell me. How the fuck? What does that got to do with Alita? Well, viewer who I can somehow hear from the future while I'm editing this in the past, I bring this up because a common retort to that claim about misogyny was I am not a misogynist. Because if I was, I would not have said Alita was a good film. Alita also has a female protagonist and is better than Captain Marvel. Keeping this in mind, the back and forth went on from there, and it became a war between the two films and their fandoms. To the point where there are actually articles now about how Aelita is a tool of the alt-right, and Aelita fans have a new favorite pastime of posting pictures and videos of Captain Marvel DVDs and Blu-rays being completely stocked while the Aelita ones are empty implying that people aren't buying Captain Marvel at all, but they are buying Aelita in droves. It's not an unfair comparison to make either, as both films have a lot in common. They both have a female lead, they're both based on a comic, uh, technically a manga in the case of Aelita, but that's just a Japanese comic, so shush. Sci-fi elements, notably aliens and extraterrestrial origins. And finally, amnesia, and how it plays into the character becoming stronger the more that they remember. Now that you know the setting, let's bring up the article in question. To be blunt, I speculate that these journalists and critics are ideologically motivated to see Aelita fail as a symbolic victory for them, and in this case, they at least want to convince you that it has failed in order to demoralize the opposition. The case made in the article, as you saw from the first segment, is that this movie was not financially successful, and they should not expect anything out of this franchise going forward. The way they demonstrate this? They put up 
other movies that are apparently comparable from years ago and show their lack of continuation as a sign that this movie will follow suit. This is actually a great idea. I really wish the writer of this article actually did that idea, because all they did was either show movies that did noticeably worse than this movie, or they showed movies that were also comparably successful and are getting continuations anyway, basically ruining his own point in the process. They thought I would just read the headline and move on, but your ass is fresh jelly sliced wrong on lightly toasted honey wheat wrong bread. The films he bring up include John Carter, Terminator Genesis, Warcraft, and The Mummy. John Carter made a domestic total of $73 million and $284 million internationally, which is less than Aelita's $404 million internationally to start off, making this a poor comparison. But that's just the start of this. Do you want to know the budget? John Carter had a budget of $250 million, which doesn't account for advertising, mind you, and it made $284 million back, which is barely a profit for Hollywood rates and well below the accepted rule of double your budget. While Aelita needed $340 to reach that goal, and it went well beyond it before even getting a physical and home video release. It should also be noted that John Carter was dead on arrival critically, meaning the incentive for a sequel pitch would be, hey Disney, do you want to make a sequel to a movie that you barely broke even on that nobody cares about? Compare that to, hey Fox, do you want to make a sequel to a movie where you doubled your investment and it has a strong following online and is well received by the fanbase? Yeah, it's absolutely no contest. Next is Terminator Genesis. Not only does that have a similar budget of $155 million, but a similar international take of $440 million, which is impressive considering that it premiered at number three domestically. It was for the most part panned by critics and fans alike, but the numbers do not lie. Whatever happened to Terminator? The writer asks, knowing another Terminator movie is already in production. Alita will, will never get a sequel. It's, it's just like they tie in the made a Terminator movie with a similar outcome, and it got a sequel. No, wait, I thought you stopped listening. Come back, please. Relapsing will take away my allowance. Is Dark Fate a reboot and not a sequel? Yes. However, the actual plot intricacies don't matter, since it's another movie in the same franchise. A reboot is the studio saying, we know you like this property just not the last one specifically, so we made some changes. Regardless, Genesis made enough money to keep the franchise alive and warrant more movies, so I have no idea why he thought it was smart to bring this up. Warcraft is a movie pretty comparable to Aelita, being fairly accurate adaptations of the source material according to the fans, generally well liked by audiences while being disfavored by critics because reasons and having success at the box office, making $433 million compared to its $160 million budget. So why is the author saying it's a flop? Because the announced sequel is currently in purgatory, which is vague terminology and could be for a variety of factors. The studio could have issues with the rights, Blizzard could be causing trouble for them, some of the actors may not want to come back, or just that little thing where the director is David Bowie's son! and his father's death may affect his mindset, you contemptuous weasel! <clears throat> Regardless, the fact it's in purgatory means a sequel is being made, even if it's taking longer. Even if it gets cancelled down the line, the fact that a sequel is even planned and started means that your premise is faulty. Finally, we have The Mummy. And this is a stronger case than the others, but it's still weak. The Mummy was Universal's attempt to start up a cinematic universe with their classic movie monsters such as Frankenstein, Dracula, the mummy, and the rest. It was the dark universe. Ooh, so edgy. And it was cancelled after the release of the mummy. The money was not the issue as it made back 409 million to its 125 million budget. The issue was that it sucked, it was bad, so reception across the board was bad. Cancelling the dark universe was a smart choice only because every future Dark Universe movie would have the bad taste of the mummy on it before anyone went to see it. 
Why do I say that this is still weak, though, if they immediately cancelled it after the release of this? Well, it's because the movies that were next in line for the Dark Universe haven't actually been cancelled. They were just taken out of the Dark Universe. The Invisible Man is still in production and slated for release next year, with Lei Whannell, he directed Upgrade, which was really fucking good, go watch it, being slated to direct, and Bloomhouse producing it. So, this is a tactical defeat in order to win the overall war. Canceling the Dark Universe but keeping all projects within it still going means <gasps> they're still being made. The franchise is still alive, even if the branding of that franchise has changed. So where does this leave us? Well, in short, Alita met the criteria for financial success, comparisons he made don't make any sense, and they weaken his argument. And the biases of the writer can be cleanly explained from my prelude regarding Captain Marvel. I don't care that he says that he liked Alita. He's specifically saying it's a bad IP in spite of the success that it has seen. And I think he's alluding to that alt-right thing that we mentioned in regards to it being a bad IP. Is that the fan base has tainted it by simply saying it's better than the shit pile that is Captain Marvel. Okay, fine. It's not necessarily a shit pile. It's just so mediocre that I hate it. The thing is, across all three of these, I just don't get how people who write for Forbes can be so smug. I don't get the incentive to do so. If anything, it would only drive people away, barring very specific circumstances. I am of the view that you can only be justifiably smug if you have demonstrable evidence for the topic that demonstrates your views to be correct. Hell, I've been super smug throughout this video, but I wouldn't even be motivated to make it at all if these opinionated rag writers just wrote more objectively. If this article was just about how Alita did in general, without the condescension about its presumed failure, I would probably commend them for presenting info on projections of future projects, because only film nerds like myself tend to actually check stuff like the box office numbers. Most people just go, wow, fun movie, I hope they make another one, and then they go back to their lives. The writers at Forbes actually rely on people not doing the work to fact check them because clicks matter more than integrity. Consider this a public service announcement from me to never read Forbes, unless it's very important. I'm in this case referencing the Kotaku article. I'd usually say never read Kotaku ever, but their expose on Anthem was surprisingly good. And I always want to leave up an exception for the rules. So who knows, maybe Forbes will write something good and groundbreaking in regards to my interest one day. In the meantime, I would not hold out hope. My goal with this video is to show you that your time and brain cells will be wasted if you read Forbes. I will no longer read Forbes. I won't click their articles, and I hope you don't either. The problem isn't exclusive to Forbes, it's just that these three articles in particular hit close to home for me. And if making this video gets them lower traffic and prevents any of you viewers from reading poorly made content, then it will be worth it. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you like content like this or any of our other previous videos, feel free to subscribe. We will be posting in the near future. I don't know what's next on the docket, so to speak. Most likely talking about Rage 2 and Rage 1, respectively. And we might even be seeing some videos from the other creators on this channel a little bit further down the line. See you next time.